see if this works. Give me $20. No, 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 no. This, give, give, can you give me another one? Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, students. Uh, we're going to do some more uh, discussion about periodic motion. And what we're going to You guys ready? Yeah, I'm looking at you guys. Good. Okay, what we're going to try to do is take a look at um, waves today. We have a demonstration with this big uh, coil spring up here in the front. It works really cool. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk about the secret of the ellipse. Because last time we talked about potential energy states, and the phase space representation of a simple oscillating system, the pendulum. One of the things that I want to uh, remind you of and reinforce is that anytime you see a potential energy that's the square of a coordinate, or as we would say, quadratic in the coordinate, that means the square of the coordinate, uh, like 1 half kx squared, you're going to have some kind of an oscillating system. In other words, along that coordinate that's squared, in this case the x-axis, you're going to get oscillation back and forth, left and right along the axis. Now it's possible to even have an angle as your coordinate. And the example that we had for that was actually uh, the swing angle of the pendulum. And then we kind of converted mentally... Uh, to an x-axis uh, by saying that the actual curved motion was really close to a flat x-axis motion. Uh, and, and I was measuring it uh, after class and thinking, you know, is that really justified? And it is. It's pretty, it's pretty, the, the difference in the distance traveled for that ellipse, or excuse me, for that pendulum uh, along the curved path versus the putative uh, flat path on the x-axis is pretty small. It's less than 10% uh, difference, so that's, that's considered good. So you could have a uh, SPE uh, that looks like this, 1 half k times theta squared, theta representing the swing angle. Okay. The other thing that we talked about last time, and this is where I want to start instruction for today, is the a phase space representation of the motion uh, of the ellipse. And, and I want to reinforce to you, this is not a picture of the pendulum. It's an abstract ref, uh, representation of the motion along the x-axis and in terms of its momentum. Now, you can't take a picture of momentum. You can measure it and stuff by making distance and time and, and mass measurements. But you can't actually snapshot, you can't put a signpost out along the uh, 200 kilogram uh, meter per second uh, marker on some imaginary roadway. Uh, you can't do that with momentum. You can with distance. You know, mile markers on the turnpike are no problem. But it, with momentum, it's a little abstract. Now, in phase space, where the momentum is represented uh, with the vertical axis and the oscillation axis or the oscillation coordinate is represented on the horizontal axis, in this case x, uh, you have an ellipse. The ellipse has specific bounds, and those are actually fairly important for us. Okay? Uh, you have max compression. I mean, if it's a spring, it's max compression. If it's a, a pendulum, it's just maximum leftward shift. That was our initial condition. Uh, we had a volunteer from the audience. I can't remember who it was. Um, and they held it out. Kimmy, I think she... Are you here, Kimmy? No? Yes? Anyway. Uh, they held it out a certain distance and then released it. 
All right, so that's the thing that we're in control of. You could do it the other way. Um, here's the, uh, the boundary line. And remember, I made kind of a rectangle. I used graph paper to do it. Uh, but you could draw in the boundary lines. There, the other um, spatial uh, boundary is maximum rightward position, max extension, if it's a spring, um, x subscript r. And we also use the notation x subscript r for the pendulum approximation. We approximated the curve path of the pendulum as a set of positions on the x-axis. Um, and we called that rightmost position x subscript r. Here's the dotted line for it. Now, the other dimension uh, on a phase space diagram is the momentum dimension, the vertical uh, part of the graph, the vertical um, set of graph paper lines. So uh, we have an up and a, and a down limit. An upper limit is P max. So that's this line up here on top. And then the, and so that's maximum rightward momentum. And then maximum leftward momentum is the negative of that. Whatever P max is, you know, 7.4, then um, the other limit, maximum leftward momentum, is negative 7.4. You know, so whatever P max is, um, you know, this one down here, this boundary line is symmetrically spaced. So we have a rectangle of some kind. You know, depending on your graph paper and how you set up your coordinates and stuff, you might actually have a square, in which case the ellipse is just a regular old circle. But in general, it's going to be an ellipse either a little bit sideways or maybe a little bit tall versus its width, but it'll be some kind of an ellipse. All right. Now, the area of the ellipse is uh, something that we finished up with uh, on the uh, document cam talking PDF. Um, and that's what we're actually going to talk about today, the secret of the area of the ellipse. Uh, the area is measured in units of angular momentum. A regular momentum P times another distance that gives you an angular momentum. Or in um, basic units, kilogram meter squared per second. Or in deluxe terminology, action. The action of the motion. And the, the, the action calculation for this oscillator is simply the area um, of this ellipse. So here it is in a little bit bigger. Here I'm going to put in the, the leftward boundary. Okay, X subscript L. And hi, Kimmy. Here's the rightward boundary and X subscript R. So double check your diagram. Uh, and here's the positive momentum, rightward momentum boundary for the ellipse. P subscript max, and then below the, the limit below which the ellipse does not go is minus P max. That's down here. All right, so there's your basic uh, layout uh, for an, any kind of an oscillating system is going to look like this. You know, a spring system, the pendulum is going to look pretty much like this. And... Uh, and this is, a, as I said before, this is an abstract uh, representation. Now, let me um, make a side note to you about this abstract representation. And, you know, we're, we're trying to educate ourselves and think like scientists, and many of you are actually starting to achieve that level of thought, conceptual thought. The last time that we did an abstract mapping of the motion of something was the velocity graph. We graphed velocity uh, versus time on the horizontal axis, and then we computed an area. And we interpreted the area as a distance traveled. Okay, so that's a fairly simple dynamical quantity. You know, how far do you go under a certain acceleration? or in a certain constant velocity. It's the area under the velocity graph. Now this area has meaning as well. And it's a different kind of a graph. It's phase space. It's not velocity graph, velocity versus time. 
uh, but it does have meaning. So the, as I mentioned last time, the area is simply the um, half of the width. So the value of x subscript r, for instance, you know, you know so that's this half. So from, from the center here out to x subscript r, that x coordinate, you know, it's going to be like 3.5 centimeters or, or 0. 0.72 meters or something like that. And then half the, the height of it, right? So that's the distance, again, from the center up to the uh, top. So that's P max. So that's maximum positive. Now, you can use, what, what you really should use is just, you know, the positive values for that because area is always going to have a positive a value. So you wouldn't, you, you could use this and then, you, you know, X subscript L would be like negative 7, uh, negative 0 0.74 meters or something like that. But to get the, in the area, you would just wrap up. Uh, use the absolute value of that. In other words, turn it into a positive number. So always use positives. All right. Now, a um, couple things I want to point out to you. X subscript R. I want you to put a little star next to that and make a note. This is what I control. I pull the spring out. I pull the pendulum out to maximum rightward position x subscript r, or, you know, maximum leftward, and then I let it go. I control that. P max, the maximum value of the momentum, that is something that you control as well with the initial position, but it also depends on the stiffness of your spring, and how large the mass is. And those are the only two things that matter. And matter of fact, here's how it works. The area is pi times the square root of mk, mass times spring constant k, inside the parentheses. Now, don't worry about calculating with this. We're going to tackle it together and get something kind of interesting. And then this, the last part of that expression is x subscript r quantity squared. And the upper one, I don't have that. But in the, I just have one power of x subscript r. But if you work it out in terms of constants and everything like that, it works out, p max works out to uh, another factor of x subscript r. Or in the homework, x2 squared. And, and xi squared, if, I mean, if we were doing those uh, two examples, all right? We're still not done. I want to factor out a factor of k and a factor of one-half. Now, I'm going to drag a k out of the square root. And when I do that, I drop the k into the denominator of the square root. I add another factor of 2 out front here, so I actually have 2 pi now. And I have a factor of 1 half in here in these parentheses, so, you know, you multiply by 2 and you multiply by a half, and you haven't changed any values. Same thing, and, and I've got a factor of k here. Now, the reason I'm doing that is so that I can get an energy. Because 1 half k times xr quantity squared is, for our system, that is the total mechanical energy. So final version of this, 2 pi, the area is 2 pi times this weird looking square root. We're going to tackle that in a second. m over k started out mk all on one line. Now we've, to get capital E total energy, we had to change that a little bit. And you could fool around with the algebra if you want. It's not too bodacious. So 2 pi times squared m over k in parentheses. And then um, in the third term, uh, total mechanical energy E. Now that's important for us 
because the total mechanical energy is something that's conserved. M and K are also conserved. I mean, they're not dynamical quantities. M and K are properties of the system. So it's something that's permanent until you break the system apart. To, I mean, until you use a different mass, this M is a constant. Until you use a different spring or you break the spring or something, this K, whatever it is, you know, 2,000 newtons per meter is going to be a constant. So everything in here is a constant. E is a dynamical constant, and M and K are constants of the design of the machine. Now, you may say to yourself, Dr. B, what the heck, oh, wait a minute, is this thing, all right, square root M over K, what in the, Dr. B, what are you up to? Well, what we're going to try to do, go ahead and put a circle around that baby. And that's going to give us the secret of the ellipse. You know, we've already figured out, we already kind of have an idea about energy. You know, we did those free fall tables, you know, where we figured out the total energy. And then we put ditto marks all the way down on the right side. And then, and then we did the crossword puzzle technique to figure out the GPE at any other level. And then the kinetic energy at any other level. And then the V if we wanted, and we could even have figured out the momentum. And you had something like that to do on homework uh, over the weekend. But this, this, we, M over K, square root, boom. So what we're actually going to try is the reciprocal of that. We're going to try to get an interpretation of the reciprocal of it, K over M, because that's going to make a little bit of sense to us in terms of things that we've already talked about. So let's focus uh, on this. And then we'll figure this one out, and then we'll kind of apply it to the, you know, the m over k square root. All right? Now, let's take a look at the units of k. k is a spring constant. All right, so write down k, spring constant. Units, newtons per meter. All right? So over here now, the units of K are newtons per meter. That's a spring constant. Uh, and the, so the numerator is a newton. And in fundamental units, we're going to do some canceling. Uh, fundamental units, we've got kilogram meter per second squared. That's a fundamental unit description of a newton, a definition of a newton. And then in the, in the denominator of, of the units is meters. So newtons per meter is the same as kilogram meter per second squared, all divided by meters. And you may be saying to yourself, Dr. B, yucky, nasty, but we could do some cancellation. Ching! Burn those two meters off. They're out of here. All right? And so K, when you boil it down to fundamental units of mass, distance, and time, K is kilogram per second squared. It's weird looking, but uh, we're not really looking at K. We're looking at K divided by M. All right? Now, what's M? That one's easy. The units of, K, of M are just kilograms. All right? So that one's the easy one. But K, the units of spring constant, this weird old kilogram per second squared. But we're not done yet. As they say on TV, wait, there's more. Okay. We're trying to get the, the square root of K over M. All right, let's look at K over M. Let's put them together now. We're, and, and when we see this, when we get this all, when we bring it all together, it's going it's, it's gonna to be really nice. All right, so K over M. All right. K, we know what that is. M, we know what that is in fundamental units. Okay, so the dimensions or the units of K over M, numerators, K, kilogram per second squared, that's up here. All right. In the numerator, in the middle part of this third equation block, the denominator is just regular old kilograms from the denominator 
or from the units of mass. Now, here's an arrow to represent it. Okay, this means you take your K units in fundamental units, put it in the numerator. Your M units, put those in the denominator, and we're good. Now, we've got something nice coming up here. I'm going to burn out some kilograms. Bye-bye, baby. Cancel those kilograms. And what are you left with? 1 over second squared. Ooh, we're getting it down to the nitty-gritty. Now we just got some power of seconds. Now let's think back to this mysterious quantity that we found in the area of the ellipse. Square root m over k. It's reciprocal square root k over m. Square root k over m. k over m itself, 1 over second squared. Square root of that, 1 over seconds. 1 over seconds is the hertz. And my wonderful students, that is a frequency. We are now looking at the secret of the ellipse. The ellipse encodes two things. The initial conditions and the structure or the design of the oscillator. The structure or design of the oscillator is encoded in the frequency. And check this out, you guys. No matter where you start the spring, one centimeter to the left, two centimeters to the left, or 22 centimeters to the left, it's going to oscillate back and forth, left and right, with the same frequency. Let me repeat that so you can jot it down. This weird square root k over m, it is a property of the system. Doesn't matter if there's nothing in there about initial conditions. It's if you have a, a spring of some constant k and a mass attached to it of some mass m, ding, you've got a frequency. So if you start from one meter to the, excuse me, one centimeter to the left, 0 0.01 meters, two centimeters to the to the right, 0 0.02 meters, or any other distance, 22 or 22,000 meters to the right. The oscillation frequency, if you haven't broken your spring, I mean, if the spring is still intact, the oscillation frequency will be the same. What does change, though? When you change... The distance that you start, you know, you pull it out from equilibrium to your starting position. What does that change? It doesn't change the frequency. It's going to oscillate back and forth, same frequency, same period. What does that change? It changes the momentum, that's correct. But what's the fundamental constant that it changes? that we just talked about, the energy. So what we've done is separate the machine from the user of the machine. When you set the initial condition, you know, one centimeter to the right or 22 centimeters to the right, you're setting the total energy, right, of that machine. The machine itself has inbuilt frequency, and that frequency is called omega. So omega is square root k over m. The area, my wonderful students, is the ratio. E times the reciprocal of the frequency omega. So that's why, you know, that's why I said we're not going to do m over k. We're going to do k over m square root. That's the reciprocal of the formula. All right, here it is back in the formula, and that omega is something that we can measure. And uh, a matter of fact, we did. We measured the period, and then we calculated the omega, or the frequency, of the pendulum. The, what was it now? About 0.22? No. What was, take a look at your notes. What was the period of the pendulum? 
about 2.2 seconds, 2.2, 2.23, 2.2 something. And so one over that was the frequency that, and I remember that one, 0 0.45, all right? And so that's, so this is something that we can do. And you know what, guys? For a pendulum, if you, if you pull it out by one inch, same frequency. It just doesn't move. It doesn't move that far, and it doesn't move as fast because it has lower energy. You move it out to a bigger starting distance, it's going to move further, same amount of time per cycle, because it has more energy. The energy level is higher. So the area of this abstract mapping for us is highly significant. And that is the secret of the ellipse, that the area of the ellipse in phase space has a physical meaning. And my wonderful students, by the end of the semester, if you're logging off. Don't let that happen. Okay. By the end of the semester, we're also going to be talking about something called the entropy. E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. I've mentioned it once already this semester. The entropy is related to the, as well to the area of this ellipse. The key that's going to tie it all together is Planck's constant. Now, before we get to Planck's constant, we're going to have to talk about atoms. Before we talk about atoms, we're going to have to talk about this famous um, uh, disaster called Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Now, last time we talked about tuning forks. Remember that we did that with the tuning forks? Darian and I, we did that. And, you know, the first tuning fork didn't have any sound. It was just, you know, Darian had her hand on it. And she took her hand away, and it acquired energy by interacting with the first tuning fork that I had hit. Okay? Then we stopped the first tuning fork that I had hit, and we listened. And it wasn't very strong, but it did pick up energy from that interaction. Now, here's a famous, 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 famous engineering disaster, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse. Here's a photo of it collapsing. So jot that word down, or jot down that phrase. And if you type Tacoma Narrows Bridge into Google or into YouTube, you'll see zillions of videos and pictures. Uh, every engineering major in this green earth has drooled over those pictures and thought, oh, if only I could have been there to, you know, am I right? You know, engineering majors, that, you know, engineering majors, they, they look at that, you know, collapse and think, what exactly was going wrong? And I'm going to show you some pictures of it. It's a bridge, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, back in like, I, don't, I think it was like 1940 or 1941, the wind was blowing at exactly the right direction, at exactly the right speed, and the atmospheric pressure and density was exactly right, that something called standing waves formed on that bridge. It caught a resonance. Now, you can't see it uh, maybe from, from, uh, from this image on the screen, but when you look at it in YouTube, you'll see that the side of the bridge has, you know, it's built, you know, each section of the bridge is like a box, a steel box, and they, and they welded them together. And so the steel box has girders, you know, above and below, side to side, front and back. And they, and they welded the back to the front of the next one, so on and so forth, or bolted it probably, all right? Big, hefty bolts. But what they did was to, for some reason, on the sides of each box, you can't really see it here very well, but the sides of each box, they just put a layer of steel over it to block the wind or to, for whatever reason. But that is what made this thing like a sail on a sailboat. It caught the wind because of that. And because it caught the wind, it went into a resonance and it collapsed. Now, I want to show you some pictures. I said that there were some standing waves. Look at these pictures. All right, now you can't. You know, you can't sketch this down. Just write down Tacoma Narrows Bridge and just go look at it. There's even, a, there's even videos 
I mean, it, these images I'm about to show you are actually from the video. This is this one here is is from the video as well. And here's another video or film. Now look at that. Don't look at your computer. Look at this. Look at my screen. That's the bridge surface. It's like about almost a 45 degree angle. That, and, and so, so here's what was happening with this bridge. It wasn't, it wasn't, un, it was undulating like this, you know, from one length, from one end to the other. But at the same time, it was going like this. It was twisting. It was torch. It was torquing. The torque is what made it collapse. And you can see the torque. Now look, here's, the, here's a second later. Oh my goodness. You see that car up there? That's a car. So this is not just some, you know, little weenie. Oh, I can just my little toe can feel it. You everybody feels it. Even that look at that car. The car is just holding on. And so there they are apart. Now if you look at if you go and look this up at YouTube, there's even a photograph or a, a series of photographs of a guy from that car, or the guy that was driving that car was a total coward. He left his little dog in the car. He ran to the other end of the bridge. He abandoned his little pupper. What a I know, it's pretty bad. It's pathetic. And that, but but there was some physics professor video, or, you know, recording it on camera, and he dashed out to to rescue the dog, and he came back. You'll see that guy, and he's he's kind of walking. You know, just think about this: if you're, just think about a ship at sea. And if you've ever raise your hand, well, maybe I shouldn't say a show of hands, but you know that if you go on on a ship at sea, there's a high probability for somebody that you know to get seasick because of the bloop, bloop, you know, and then they start blorting over the side of the ship and, you know, it's miserable, right? Just think about getting seasick from this. But anyways, that guy ran out there. He got the little dog and brought it back, the hero of the day. But boy, that bridge fell apart right after that. Can you imagine? Anyway, that's a resonance. And what, what happened there was standing waves. Now, what we're going to do now, I'm going to pause the podcast, and we're, Caroline and Darian are going to do a standing wave demonstration up here. And I want you to take notes. And I want you to make sketches. Turn the lights on. And let me pause the podcast for just a second. Back to the podcast. All right. Now, a little bit about nomenclature. I just mentioned wavelength. The wavelength is the physical distance in millimeters, nanometers, meters, kilometers, whatever distance unit you want to use, between the two peaks, between two adjacent peaks in the wave. All right? And so you could go like this, you know, between these two peaks, or you could... Now watch my animation. All right, I'm going to dip over to these two. Yeah, that's okay. Or you could dip down here. Look at this. Take a look at this. Add this to your sketch. You could do the distance between two successive troughs. Okay, or any two matching points. The easy ones to see are the peaks and the troughs. So this is a wavelength. Now, a half a wavelength is simply this. The distance from half a wave. Okay, that in other words, the length of one bump. From the beginning of the bump to the end of the bump. Or you could go, watch this now, check my diagram, check my diagram, check my diagram. Check my diagram. Look, don't look at your computer, look at my diagram. All right. All right, you can use this one, the distance across a single dip, all right? So half a, half a wave is a bump or a dip. A full wave is from peak to peak or from the beginning of a bump to the end of a dip. You can think of it that way too, 
or from trough to trough. Okay. Now let me ask you some clicker questions. Get your click, get thy clickers out. Do you have the, the uh, software running? Now this one, I want you to talk with your neighbors. Question one, which wave mode in the demonstration that we just did had the shorter wavelength? Look at your sketches and know that the distance from Caroline to Darien did not change. Darien simply rotated a little bit so that Different parts of the room could see her. So the distance from the end to end was the same. If you made sketches, you know, so that's about 12 feet from end to end. But you have different numbers of bumps and dips in your sketches. Go ahead and vote. Okay, 15 seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, very good. You guys, most of you got it right. Yes, yeah, second excited. So make a note of that. Second excited state, shorter wavelength. By the same token. So this is a side note. All right. So this, this clicker question is actually part of your notes, hopefully, if you're using your brain. Side note, the fundamental has the bigger wavelength. And then the first excited state is mezza mezza, right in between. Okay, so the fundamental mode, and here's one way to think about that. The fundamental mode, you had half of a wave for 12 feet. Let's say that the distance from Darien to Caroline was 12 feet. Okay, so that's half of a wave. The full wave would be 24 feet. So make a note of that. The wavelength of the fundamental that Carolyn and Darien were working was about 24 feet. All right, because 12 feet was half of a half of a wave, either a bump or a dip. All right, it oscillated from bump to a dip, and you didn't get more than one. You only had one of each. You know, from a bump up down to a dip. Now, the second excited state, you had two bumps and a dip, or two dips and a bump. All right, so that's three half waves. So let's see, 12 divided by 3 is 4. So each half of a wavelength was 4 feet. So, all right, here we go. The wavelength of the second excited state was 8 feet. Because in 12 feet from Caroline to Darien, you got a wave and a half. A full wave, a bump and a dip, and then another dip or a bump. Another half wave. So 8 plus 4 is 12. Okay. So the wavelength uh, of the second excited state was 8. Smaller. And that's what we've got here. All right, next question. Let me ask you about frequencies. Let's see if you have a brainstorm about this one. Which wave mode in the demonstration had the smaller frequency? And this one you've got to remember what you saw. Try to remember what you saw. S smaller frequency means what? Okay, smaller frequency means Ca Caroline was generating the wave, and she she was basically 
shaking it up and down. And Darian was just holding her end fixed. Okay? And Darian was shaking it up and down. And until she got the right frequency, she didn't have jack. She didn't have... By the way, these are three standing waves. They don't seem... They're waves. They don't seem to be going anywhere. They seem to be standing in place. But really, waves are traveling left. And then they... They, they travel from Caroline to Darien, and then they bounce off Darien's end, because she's got it fixed, and it goes back towards Caroline. So you have two waves going and crossing paths, and the results are, are these standing waves, or zip-zap if you don't have the right frequency. All right, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zip zap. Okay. Yeah, most of you guys got it right. Fundamental mode had it and, and think of it this way. Make a, a side note to yourself. Fundamental mode, smaller frequency. Caroline didn't have to shake it that fast. And then she sped up to get the first excited state and even faster to get the, the second excited state. All right. And that's something that she controlled. All right. Now, as I mentioned before, resonance and standing waves, these are all features of something, or these are phenomena that arise from something called interference. The interference of waves. All right? And that's what we're going to talk about now. And we're going to talk about the concepts and then I'm going to show you one more application of interference that hopefully you never have to encounter. All right, so let's take a look at this. Okay, interference of waves. It's behind uh, many wave effects that we see. And I'll just make a side note for studying purposes. We're in Chapter 7, and I believe it's actually 7.5 that talks about standing waves. Now... What you have to have is at least two sources of waves that interact. All right, now, in the demonstration, go ahead and make a note of this, Anastasia. In the demonstration, Caroline was one source, and Darien was actually the other source. It was simply reflecting off Darien's fixed hands, but it was as if she was another source, because from Darien... They proceeded back to the uh, right towards Caroline, right? So the two sources, Caroline, primary source, secondary reflecting source, Darien, All right? Now, here's the picture. Now, go ahead and make a sketch, okay? I'm not going to make any comments on here except to show you these pictures. Now, this is kind of a simplified or idealized um, picture of two bumps. Bump A traveling to the right, bump B traveling to the left. All right? Now, as I mentioned, all the waves that reflected from Darien moved back to the right. All the waves that Caroline generated moved off to the left, all right, in, in, from your point of view, all right? So this is like isolation of two bumps. Now, when they meet, that's down here where it says A plus B, the two waves add together, okay? Uh, and that's called interference. They add, they they add up to a great big wave. If you were out in the ocean, this would be like a rogue wave. If you've ever heard of that, if you watch the Discovery Channel or, or one of the other uh, channels on TV, sometimes they have, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, well, why did the Bermuda Triangle, you know, uh, capture all those ships? Well, some people think it's because of rogue waves, Okay. Here's another example. Um, uh, Praia de Norte in St. Nazaire, Portugal, is formed by waves meeting at just the right time to get mega waves. 
really, really big waves when the waves are in the right condition. Now, here's the, here's the third stage. Take a look at this. Eyeballs now. Look at what we got. Eyeballs. Yeah. All right, there's the third stage. After they interact, rogue wave time, then they just keep going. All right, so if you're out there in the middle of the ocean and you get some waves, you know, so there's a storm off the coast of West Africa and a storm off the coast of Newfoundland, somewhere between those two, uh, there's going to be a place where the waves interact and you're going to get a rogue wave for at least a second. And then the waves are going to keep going. You know, one's going to keep going off towards Newfoundland from Africa and the other one from Newfoundland towards Africa. And they're just going to motate, you know, on their merry way. They do not destroy each other. Okay. This is known as constructive interference. Okay. They add up. They're cons construct. They build something bigger. Now, here's another variation. You know, a real ocean wave is con composed of um, a crest and then a trough, and then a crest and then a trough. Now, this picture is just two crests, right? Now, here's two troughs, right? And what I did with this, I just took the previous picture and I turned it upside down and relabeled it. Here comes A from a trough from the left to the right, and B from the right to the left, and where they meet is an extra deep trough. Okay? Now, after they interact, A plus B, they move off in their original directions. The waves do not destroy, are, are not destroyed. And let me give you another concept that's not on the slides, but it's a good thing to write down. Waves do not transport matter per se. These are not water from West Africa heading to Newfoundland. What's heading from West Africa to Newfoundland is energy and momentum. Waves transport energy and momentum. The motion of matter in the ocean is basically up and down. All right. Now, if there's a current, you know, that'll affect the waves a little bit too, but usually the currents are not that fast. Okay, but waves travel very can travel very fast. Okay, across the ocean. Okay, way faster than the current. Right, so waves transport energy and momentum, but you're not getting water from West Africa uh, heading up to Newfoundland. Energy is heading to New Newfoundland. Momentum is heading towards Newfoundland. And from the other storm, from Newfoundland down to the coast of West Africa, energy and momentum, but you're not getting water molecules from Canada either. I mean, unless you, you, know, you follow the Gulf Stream, and the Gulf Stream does that. But waves, no. It's just matter and uh, it's momentum and energy. Now, second example. You know, we've looked at two crests interacting. You get a big rogue wave, enough to sink a ship. Or two troughs interacting, big deep trough, enough to sink a ship. Well, hopefully not. Now, what if a trough and a crest... Interact. So here's trough A moving left to right. So this is a new sketch. It's your third sketch. Okay, trough, or excuse me, bump A, crest A, moving from left to right, and trough B moving from right to left. All right, where they interact, if they're exactly the same size, A plus B is your interaction point. But if they're exactly the same height and exactly the same shape, you don't get jack. You get zip-zap, flat water. This, my wonderful students, is called destructive interference.
All right, so destructive interference. So you can have those two storms, you know, one off the coast of West Africa, one off the coast of Newfoundland, and in between them, you're going to get zones of constructive and destructive. Flat water oscillating with um, zones of deep troughs and huge crests, right, if the conditions are right. And it will change with time because these things are also in motion. It can be really complicated. Now, after they interact, okay, at the top here now, A plus B flat water, and then after they interact, boop, they just keep going. You don't lose the trough. They interact, and then they keep going. Now, that is an example of waves in the ocean. And believe it or not, my wonderful students, this is also what was happening with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster. Here, and actually, here's what was happening with Tacoma Narrows Bridge. They were getting big troughs and big crests. And you know what the, 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 the wavelength was? It was between the two. You know how a bridge, a suspension bridge, you'll have the two uh, big uh, piers, you know, and, the, and the, the curving wire, you know, to support the bridge between the two piers. Those two, th those two piers, the bridge is fixed. They, they fixed the bridge there. They bolted it to the two piers. So the, the, the bridge there is not going to move. But between the two piers, you know, between the two big towers, that's where it's going to oscillate, All right? So you get big peaks like this, and then big troughs like this. And then in between them, you get flat water or a, a little few centimeters of bridge that doesn't really move if the conditions are right. But... It builds and it builds and it builds and eventually the bridge can't oscillate any for further. The concrete breaks apart, the steel breaks, and the bridge falls down as it did. And they've since replaced it and stuff. They didn't repair it. They just put in a new one, I guess. And we now know how to avoid that uh, disaster because of the, the way that the, the bridge was built. Okay, so two sources of waves. Let's go through it again at certain points. You might have two crests meeting for a super big surf or like Praia do Norte in St. Nazaire, Portugal or a rogue wave if you're out in the middle of the ocean. Um, at other points, you might have two troughs extra deep. Those are um, both uh, three and four. Those are constructive interference. At other points, you can get a crest and a trough interacting. You have no wave, uh, i.e. flat water. Okay, so... Uh, three and four, where they add together, that's called constructive interference. And where they cancel out, that's, you know, where, where you get flat water for just an instant of time at a specific location, flat water, that's destructive interference. So two waves, you know, they can go from one side of the Atlantic to the other and, you know, or two sets of, uh, two trains of waves and they'll set up destructive and constructive depending on what part of the interaction you look at. Some parts will be flat water, some people will be some parts will be rogue waves, some parts will be rogue troughs, you know, really deep troughs. Now I want to show you another um, interference effect. So this is like eight in this list here of notes. And it's the other demonstration that we had last Thursday with the tuning forks. And that was the phenomenon of beats. Remember when I put that little clip on one of the tuning forks? Yep. And I said, you know, you, you, you get two waves, two sources again, two tuning forks, two sources. One of them slightly flat. And if it's slightly flat, you can hear the beats. Right now, what you're actually hearing are oscillating regions or moving regions of destructive and constructive interference. So here's, a, here's kind of a stylized picture. Here's an actual picture of constructive and destructive and then another zone of constructive. Here's two waves, and th this is much better than the previous diagram. This is one I made. So here are two waves, slightly different frequency, 
slightly different wavelength lambda. By the way, that kind of weird looking upside down Y, that's a Greek lowercase lambda. I forgot to mention that to you in the previous slide. Um, yeah, so here's, here's my two waves. Here are the specs. Okay, center line. Go ahead and make sketches of these. Here's the sea level. If you think about them as ocean waves or, or any other system, equilibrium. Okay, so they're oscillating um, above and below equilibrium. You know, whether it's sea level ocean waves or it might be um, electric field oscillating between you know, positive and negative and back to positive and then back to negative. Uh, and slightly different frequencies. Now, I actually will give you the free two frequencies. Here they are. 106.7 hertz for the first one. And 119.5 hertz. All right. Now, I want you to look at those two, two waves. They start out... Over here on the left, they look pretty close. But now look over here, right about, let's see. Right about here, you have a crest of wave two interacting with a trough of wave one. All right, so right there, you're going to be getting destructive interference. Now, I'm going to show you below what the combination of these two uh, waves would be. So if these were sound waves, this is what it would look like. This is what you'd hear. So this thick blue line shows you what you would hear. All right. Now, here's your... You're going to hear this, this frequency, okay? But it's going to, it's going to be loud over here and very faint right here right now these things are in motion as well so it's moving from point A to point B across the ocean across the room towards your ear so when this first one here this first maximum amplitude hits your ear sounds loud but then when this minimum amplitude this is pretty close to flat water here when that hits your ear you don't hear it, it's faint. And then it buzzes back up here. This is the next one to hit your ear. The maximum amplitude. All right? Now, the frequency of the beats is simply the subtraction of little from big. So in this case, it's F2 minus F1. That works out to 12.8 hertz. Okay? And that's a pretty low... Uh, beat frequency. Okay, and that's kind of what you guys heard. You know, when we had it just right, it sounded, you know, kind of like a creepy sound from a, you know, a science fiction movie, you know, with the, when the mad scientist turns on his machine to try to hypnotize the, the hero, or, you know, whatever it is. Okay, that's what you heard. You know, you know, I can't even do it, but we all heard it. All right, and if you calculate out the wavelength, I'll show you how to calculate this wavelength on Tuesday uh, using the wave equation, which I was going to try to do today, but we're going to run out of time. Uh, the wavelength is 6.25 meters for this particular example. And that's the distance between maximum amplitude. So peak to peak, that's your beat wavelength. Okay. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Dr. B, what the, nobody goes around with tuning forks and putting little teeny clips on them and stuff like that. Yeah, you're right, they don't. But what people do uh, experience is cops with speed guns using radar waves, not sound waves. And I'm going to show you how that works. Uh, let me pause... Um, and dip over to the computer display. I have a YouTube. Go ahead and write down uh, Railfan Amsterdam, New York. And is, you, so you can, and I'll link this on the homework and stuff. I want you to listen to the horn. Is that thing running? Go ahead and click it. Listen to the train's horn. G 
you hear that? Did you hear what happens? Go ahead and stop it and back it up. Let's listen to that again. Listen to the pitch of the train's horn as it passes by the guy with the camera. Go ahead. And you can look, just type in rail fan in YouTube, and you can, there's millions of these. But this one's pretty easy to get to the pitch change. Listen. Stop it. What happened to the pitch? It drops. My wonderful students. Okay, go back to the regular display. That drop in pitch is called the Doppler effect. Right. And here's a, a little blurb about it. Uh, and just, you know, here's the YouTube. I'll link this in, in the homework so you can look at it again. The Doppler effect. If a source of sound is coming toward you, the pitch or frequency will, it'll sound higher than usual. So if you're in the, and go ahead and make a note of it this way. If you're in the, in the freight yard and that train is at rest and you're just standing there and he toots on the horn, you'll hear it a certain note. Okay. And then if you go down to this intersection and you watch him coming towards you and he blows the horn, you think, ooh, that's a little bit high. When he's coming towards you, the pitch is a little bit higher, comma, the frequency is a little bit larger. Let me repeat that. Doppler effect. When the source is coming toward you, the frequency is higher. Sound waves or electromagnetic waves. Similarly, after the train passed, now the train is moving away from the observer. And what happens? The pitch goes down a little bit. Right? Now, it's still the same horn, and if it were in the freight yard, it'd sound the same, you know, you'd think, well, this thing sounds normal. But as soon as the observer and the source are in motion relative to each other, the pitch changes. The observer will report a higher pitch when the source is coming towards him, and the observer will report a lower pitch as the source moves away. This is how uh, meteorologists analyze radar signatures to look at, the, especially when they're looking for tornadoes, when they see um, Doppler radar signals at a slightly higher pitch and then just a few hundred yards away to the left, slightly lower pitch, that means they have water coming one way and the opposite way uh, separated by a few hundred meters. And that means you've probably got rotation, which means you have to worry a lot about tornadoes. All right now, this is also how they catch people. And nobody in here, I know you are all nice law-abiding uh, young men and women, but you know that the cops nab people for speeding. So here's how it works. The return signal, if the car is moving towards the policeman, it's slightly higher. Now, he has an oscillator generating radar frequency radiation, all right? So the incoming radiation, slightly higher versus the built-in frequency, he's going to hear, be well, his machine will measure beats. And that beat frequency um, is how they nab you. From the beat frequency, they can figure out how fast you're moving. I'll show you the formula on, uh, Tuesday, on Thursday. Now, if the move, car is moving away from the, the policeman, same thing. You have a slightly lower return frequency. So he zaps it out from his car at a certain frequency. If you're moving away, it's going to come back to him just slightly dipped, but just enough for him to measure it. All right? 
So let's do a clicker question together. All right, here we go. One more clicker question. Let's see if you guys can. All right. So here's your traffic policeman. Outgoing. So the outgoing is 10.05 gigahertz. All right, so that's like the factory setting. And he bounces it off a car, and it comes back at 10.02 gigahertz. Right, so is the car approaching, moving away, at rest, or going across this field of view? Go ahead and vote. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Answer is uh, good. Um, most of you, the majority of you got that. Some of you voted for A. If the car was coming toward him, it would be higher. So make a note. If you answered A, that means higher pitch higher frequency, but that's not what he measures. He measures a lower frequency, all right? So that's the dot. That's how we get, or that's how people get caught. And I've been caught speeding recently. You know, last fall I, get, I had to go to traffic school and stuff like that, a pain in the neck. All right, um, homework tonight, supper time or so. You're dismissed. Uh, good class today. Turn the lights on. Good. Just about right. Except I have one question. How come you?